Welcome to the Walk Worthy Podcast, a podcast by Hesper Baptist Church located in Cambridge, Ontario. Our local church exists to make disciples who walk worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. We hope and pray this is encouragement to you and to anyone else you would share this with. Well, thank you, Ben and your team, for leading us in the music and for selecting songs and hymns that go so well with the text uh, that will be before us this morning. Some years ago, our son and his wife had a cat. Now, that in itself is bad enough. (laughs) But worse yet was the fact that they called this cat Epiphany. (laughs) Epiphany is merely an anglicized a form of a Greek word which means appearance. The term epiphany is used of both of Christ's appearances, of his historical appearance at his incarnation, and of his future appearance at his second coming. Christ's first appearance was the epiphany of grace. Christ's second appearance will be the epiphany of glory. That's what we have before us this morning. If you turn in your Bibles, please, to Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11 to 15. Titus chapter 2, as we continue our series through this wonderful letter of Paul to Titus, reading then from verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Now, before we continue, let's just pray together. Lord God, as we uh, come to this uh, wonderful text this morning, which speaks so powerfully to us concerning our Lord Jesus Christ and the wonderful work which he has accomplished for us, I pray that our minds will be opened and receptive to the truth, and our hearts will be touched, our wills will be controlled, and our consciences touched as we come before you under the authority of this, your written word. For this we pray, for the glory of our Savior, in his name, amen. The subject then, I think, of this uh, passage is, concerns the impact of the grace of God on how we live now, the impact of the grace of God on how we should live. And the central idea, or if I were to put the whole sermon in a sentence, you can't leave after this sentence, but if I was to contract the whole thing down to a sentence, is that God's saving grace constrains us, constrains how we live now in view of our hope in the future. God's Saving grace constrains how we live now in view of our hope in the future. So first, we are directed then towards the appearance of God's grace at Christ's first coming, verses 11 and 12. The appearance of God's grace at Christ's first coming. For the grace of God, verse 11 says, has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now, the word for here then links this paragraph to the previous paragraph, verses 1 to 10, where Paul sets out all of those ethical standards and instructions for the people of God that are rooted in and proceed from sound doctrine, as we read in chapter 1, verse 9, and chapter 2, verse 1. In this regard, I came across a few years ago a wonderful quote by in, uh, in a book by Os Guinness, and I don't remember exactly the name of it. I think it was Carpe Diem, but uh, 
Uh, I'm not quite sure about that, but Osginus writes this, and this is worth writing down. He says, a truth well stated is excellent, but a truth well lived is priceless. A truth well stated is excellent, but a truth well lived is priceless. That's the point in this passage. This is what Paul is driving home time after time to Titus. Sound doctrine is to be well stated, but it only becomes effective and powerful when it's well lived. That's how we become, as Sean said last week, gospel influencers. That's why these ethical behaviors are so important across the demographic spectrum of the church. Elders who are are above reproach. Older men who exemplify steadfastness. Older women who model reverent behavior. And so to train young women how to be wives and mothers. Younger men who manifest self-control and slaves who practice submission and honesty. And you may ask, them, why should God's people live according to such ethical standards? Paul says it here. Because or for the grace of God has appeared. You see, for Christians, the appearance of the grace of God changes everything about how we live. That's how we adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in everything, so that God's grace is manifested in us. Now, the grace of God is a hard term to define. Grace itself is a very difficult word for us to define because it is so broad. At its root, it has to do with God's unmerited favor toward us. But it has so much broader semantic range in Scripture than that. John Stott has suggested that a synonym for grace could be generosity. And while I think that that word in itself still falls a little bit short, what I think it does is it reflects the idea of God's lavish love, God's kindness, God's goodness, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, which abound toward us. All of this is wrapped up in this term of grace. And His grace is rooted in his essential nature of love. Because God is love, he extends his grace toward us. His grace, therefore, is a free gift which you must receive in order for it to benefit you. And so without any merit on our part, or any obligation for that matter on God's part, he bestowed his sovereign favor on us. That is his grace. God's grace Therefore, is his undeserved mercy and forgiveness, which he manifested in Christ at his incarnation. As Paul puts it, and we read it in, rather, I should say, in 2 Timothy 1, he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. His grace is his favor that stems from his sovereign choice of us. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, we read earlier. For where sin increased, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, grace abounded all the more. Now notice the characteristics then of God's grace. Firstly, the manifestation of God's grace is visible. It's visible. At Christ's incarnation, the grace of God appeared so that we could see and we could hear and we could know God's grace in human flesh. The grace of God appeared through Jesus' life and teachings and most fully through his death and resurrection. God's grace has appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. The term here, has appeared, was typically one that was used in connection with the rising of the sun above the horizon at daybreak, beaming its light to all in its circuit around the world. This is what happens spiritually and symbolically at the first epiphany, the first appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his incarnation, the grace of God has appeared like the sun, rising in its strength 
and beauty at the start of the day, shining in all of its brilliance above the dark backdrop of of human depravity, ushering in a new and glorious day. That's the thought here. And so the grace of God is, if you will, personified in Jesus Christ, appearing visibly in the world, in his flesh, in him. And so Paul subsumes the entire first coming of Christ in this wonderful phrase, the grace of God has appeared. God's grace personified in Jesus has appeared. It appeared in his lowly birth. It appeared in his gracious words. It appeared in his compassionate acts. It appeared in his atoning death. And it appeared in his life-giving resurrection. The entirety, you see, of Jesus' life was an epiphany of grace. When he appeared on earth, God's grace was visibly manifested to us in his person. Salvation is only possible and available because of the grace of God alone in Christ alone. We don't deserve it, and we couldn't earn it. It is the gift of God. And so with Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, I think it is, we say thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. So first then, as to the character of God's grace, we see that the manifestation of God's grace is visible. And secondly, the object of God's grace is redemptive. The object of God's grace is redemptive. At the first coming of Christ... The grace of God appeared bringing salvation. Now the ESV here, I think, connects the phrases correctly. That in Christ, the grace of God appeared. The purpose of which was to bring salvation to all people. Not that the grace of God has actually appeared to all people as it is rendered elsewhere. For clearly some have not been exposed to the saving grace of God in the gospel. In other words, the emphasis here is on the fact of Christ's appearing and the purpose of his appearing, namely, to bring salvation. God's grace then has as its object our salvation. The grace of God is saving in its essential character. The purpose and effect of the appearing of God's grace in Christ was to bring salvation salvation. That's what the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ did. He came to bring salvation to us and for us. I came, Jesus said in John 10, that they might have life and have it abundantly. Redemption is both the motivation and the object of God's grace. For God is first and foremost a saving God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Paul says in Romans chapter 3. For grace, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, as we read earlier in Ephesians chapter 2. God in his grace and mercy wants to save you. For the object of his grace is redemptive. It's our salvation. First, then, the manifestation of God's grace is visible. Second, the object of God's grace is redemptive. And thirdly, the scope of God's grace is universal. The scope of God's grace is universal. At his first appearing, he brought salvation for all people. The grace of God in Christ is universally available for all people. In Jesus, the saving grace of God is dispersed throughout the world for the benefit of all. He became a man so that we might know and see God's grace. The Word, John says in in John's Gospel, chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, full of grace and truth, for the law came by Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. The light of God's grace in Christ appeared, bursting in upon human history to make salvation known and possible for all people, regardless of ethnicity, of religion, of gender, or social status. 
Jews and Gentiles, old and young, men and women, slave and free. No one is beyond the scope of God's grace. The point is not that everyone who has ever lived has heard the gospel, for all have not heard the gospel. Rather, Paul is saying that God's grace has appeared in the person of Jesus Christ, bringing salvation for all people, regardless of their rank and their religion, their race, their color, or culture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Note that it does not say salvation of all people. Rather, it says that at the first coming of Christ, he brought and provided salvation for all people. Just a little preposition, but what a big difference in meaning. God is a saving God, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But that does not mean that everyone will be saved. Indeed, we can say assuredly on the authority of the Word of God that the grace of God does not save all people. In fact, we know from Scripture that only those whom God has chosen to be saved will actually be saved. Why is this, you ask? Well, it is because unless God chose some to be saved, no one would be saved because of our utter depravity. Nonetheless, it's true to say that the scope of salvation is for all people. And thus salvation here describes a a potentiality, not necessarily an actuality. Salvation for all was the purpose of Christ's coming, not salvation of all. Why? Because salvation is conditional upon faith in Christ. God's grace in salvation has to be received as a free gift. The fact that everyone does not accept His grace does not negate the offer or the availability of of God's grace, nor the desire of God's heart that all should be saved. So the manifestation of God's grace, firstly, is visible. The object of God's grace is redemptive. The scope of God's grace is universal. And fourthly, the effect of God's grace is behavioral, behavioral or practical, verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. It's one thing to state how one should live. It's another thing to do it. Only by the saving grace of God can we live as Christians ought to live in accordance with God's holy and doctrinal standards. So in the light of God's grace that was displayed in Christ, At his first appearing, live your lives according to and in in accordance with sound Christian ethics. That's the whole flow of thought in this passage and the one that went before and in the one that went before that. In fact, we could say that's the flow of thought throughout the entire epistle. Training here, you see, when it speaks of training us, includes both positive instruction and negative chastisement when it's needed. It has the sense of discipline, training and correction and rebuke. God's grace teaches us two things, one negative and one positive. First, it trains us what we must give up. So negatively, what we must give up, how we should not live. When we receive the grace of God personally by faith, we must renounce, this verse says, or give up, our former way of life, precisely because there are ethical implications to the gospel. See, when you trust Christ, you can't live just any way you want. There are radical changes in a life that has been converted to Christ. We renounce the things from which He has saved us. We don't just avoid them, we hate them. 
We give them up. We renounce ungodliness. That defiance of God that characterizes unbelievers. That rank disregard for God. The rebellious rejection of God. We renounce ungodliness and we renounce worldly passions. The passions that reflect the values of this world. Be it atheism, materialism, sensualism, self-indulgence. Those passions of the flesh, 1 Peter 2 says, which wage war against the soul. To renounce these things implies that our lives are radically different from the world. D.L. Moody once said, I thought when I became a Christian, I had nothing to do but just to lay my oars in the bottom of the boat and float along. But I soon found that I would have to go against the current. That's what it is to be radically different. The effect then of God's grace is not only to train us as to what we should give up, but it trains us as to what we should take up. The former being negative and this one being positive. Not only how we should not live, but how we should live. Salvation by grace demands obedience to the Lordship of Christ. The grace of God trains us to live self-controlled lives. This has to do with ourselves. Disciplined. Temperate. Orderly lives. The grace of God trains us to live upright lives. This has to do with our relationship to others. Living justly and uprightly. And thirdly, the grace of God teaches us to live godly lives. This has to do with our relationship to God. So you see there, all the relationships are covered. To ourselves, to others, and to God. And to God it is a relationship of piety. Doing what is pleasing to to God. A Godward attitude. All of this applies to this present age, the verse says. How we are to live now. Christian living takes its character from the grace of God. Not from contemporary society. Not from culture around us. Not from philosophy. Not from the ethics of the world, such as they are. Dietrich Bonhoeffer died under the Nazis for his faith. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he ably points out that there are two kinds of grace. The first he calls cheap grace. And I quote, Cheap grace offering forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Liberty without discipleship. Salvation without the cross. And grace without the living and incarnate Jesus Christ. That's cheap grace. And there's costly grace, which he says is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck the eye, pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. He says it is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. End of quote. God's grace, you see, is costly. So don't cheapen it. God's grace cost him the death of his son. Cost him the death of his son in order to redeem us from ungodliness and worldly passions and to redeem us for self-controlled, upright, godly living. Once you've received the grace of God in Christ, you can't go back to live as you did before. That would be to cheapen God's grace. To take grace without the cross. God's grace demands a total change of life. Changed character. Self-controlled rather than uncontrolled in worldly passions and ungodliness. A changed attitude. 
living for Christ's return in such a way that we will not be ashamed before him at his coming. Changed relationships with others and with God and changed behavior, zealous for good works. Now, if you've professed to be saved, let me ask you this. Has your life changed? If not, then are you truly saved? The Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. 1 John chapter 3 says this. Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Listen to this. He who sins is of the devil. So then we have seen the appearance of God's grace at Christ's first coming. Secondly, the appearance of God's glory at Christ's second coming. The appearance of God's grace at Christ's first coming. The appearance of God's glory at Christ's second coming. The appearance of God's glory at Christ's second coming has to do with God, that, that God's grace, let, let me put it this way, God's grace is in the present, God's glory is in the future. Jesus Christ has already appeared in grace and he will reappear in the future in glory. His first coming was the manifestation of God's grace and his second coming will be the manifestation of his glory. Just as God's grace burst into human history in the person of Christ at his first appearing, so God's glory will burst into human history in the person of Christ at his second coming or his second appearing. If God's grace instructs us how to live, then God's glory motivates us what to live for. Or to put it another way, Christian behavior is characterized by the past appearance of God's saving grace, and it is conditioned by the future appearance of God's glory. Notice then two aspects of, the, of Christ's second appearing. The appearance of God's glory at Christ's second coming will be the realization of our blessed hope in verse 13. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are waiting, Paul says, for our hope to become reality. What Christ has done for us in his first appearing generates in us the anticipation of what he will do in us at his second appearing. We are expecting our blessed hope. We're waiting for our blessed hope. We're looking for our blessed hope. The second coming of Christ is our blessed hope. A few years ago, I read a book called Born Survivors. I read, I've read more than one book in the last few years, but it tells the story of three women who didn't know each other each of whom became pregnant just before they were incarcerated at the Nazi, Nazi concentration camp at Auschwitz. Just before the war ended, they were transferred to an extermination camp at Mauthausen in Austria. After miraculously surviving the ordeal of starvation and disease and extermination, in May 1945, American soldiers finally came to announce that the war was over. Just as the soldiers were driving up the driveway of the prison camp to announce the liberation of the captives, some of the prisoners were so weak and so ill, as their liberators drove into the camp, they died. They just couldn't hold on any longer. So close. And yet they missed the realization of their hope. As I read that, I wondered how many will be like that at Jesus' second coming. 
just when he is about to appear in glory, some people will be so close to putting their faith in him, but just miss redemption because they put it off for one more day. They'll never enter into the realization of the blessed hope. They'll never participate in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The realization of the Christian's hope isn't in any doubt. This isn't a Christmas wish book kind of hope. This isn't a dreamy kind of hope. It just hasn't happened yet. It is still future. It's secure, it's certain, and it's imminent. By imminent, we mean it could happen at any time. It's a blessed hope because it brings salvation. A hope that is the culmination of divine favor. A hope that spurs us on in times of trouble and sorrow and distress. A hope that motivates us to live daily in the light of Christ's imminent return. That's what we're waiting for. Expectantly and eagerly. And yet over the course of my adult life as I observe Christian life in general, Christians in general, observe their lifestyles, observe what they talk about, what they think about, what they read, what they watch. I think so many Christians are not living in the expectation of Christ's return. The reality of our hope is the appearing of the glory when he will come resplendent in his own glory on the, crowd, uh, on the clouds, then we will see him in all of his majesty and in all of his power. That's our blessed, our confident, our expected hope for which we are waiting and trusting. He who came in humility is the one who will come in majesty. He who came in grace is the one who will come in glory. The appearance of God's glory at Christ's second coming then will be the realization of our blessed hope and secondly, it will be the revelation of our great Savior. The revelation of our great Savior. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a a people for his own possession who are zealous for Good works. Now notice Jesus Christ, it says, is our great God. This is one of the most overt and indisputable statements of the deity of Christ. Jesus is God. Make no doubt about it. He is our great God because there is no other like him. There is none beside him. For compared to him, no one is great. Our great God will be the manifestation of the glory of God. At his first appearing, he fully manifested God's grace. At his second appearing, he will fully manifest God's glory. The one who brought salvation in grace will complete salvation in glory. Jesus Christ is our great God. And he is our great Savior. He's our great Savior because He gave Himself for us, verse 14 says. When He comes in glory, we will see the one who gave Himself for us, the sacrificial Lamb of God, the Son of God who loved me, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, and gave Himself for me. The purpose of His sacrifice was to redeem us from all lawlessness, to redeem us from ungodliness and worldly passions that we read about in verse 12, to liberate us from the bondage of the world, the flesh, and the devil. He gave himself, Galatians 1 verse 4 says, for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. And so the purpose of his sacrifice was to redeem us from all lawlessness, And the object of his sacrifice was to purify for himself a people for his own possession. A purified people, his own special people, his chosen people, a people for his own pleasure, a people who are fit for his presence, a people who are zealous for 
good works. He's redeemed us from all lawlessness. And in response, we must be and are enthusiastic to live for good works, self-control, uprightness, and godliness, as verse 12 says. By Christ's redemption, we are ransomed by him from evil works. By Christ's sanctification, we are possessed by him for good works. While we wait for him to come, let us be doing our duty, being faithful to Christ, zealous for good works for which we were created, as we read earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, and by which we glorify him. Well, we're living between Christ's two epiphanies, two appearances, between his incarnation in the past and his glorification in the future, between the already and the not yet. And between these two magnificent events, Paul calls us to live a godly life in this present age. Therefore, we need to look in two opposite directions. We need to look backward in memory of his epiphany of grace, whose purpose was to redeem us from all evil and purify us for God. And we need to look forward in anticipation of the epiphany of glory, whose purpose is to complete the salvation he began at his first appearing. This then gives us the orientation for Christian living. This answers the question, how should we now live? Remember our thesis, our summary, our our sermon in a sentence. God's saving grace constrains how we live now in view of our hope in the future. Living in the obligation of his grace, and at the same time, living in the expectation of his glory, living in the light of his first appearance, in which he has appeared now once at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, Hebrews 9.26, and yet also living in the light of his second appearing, in which he will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, Hebrews 9.28 says, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And at the center of both of his appearings stands the cross of Christ. Salvation began at his appearing in flesh, and it will be completed at his appearing in glory. Salvation is both a present reality and a future certainty, because the same Savior who has already come, will come again. Is that your hope? Is your manner of life conformed to the appearance of God's grace and constrained by the appearing of God's glory? Do you look back with gratefulness to the day when you receive by faith the grace of God in Christ? And do you look forward by faith to the day when you will enter the glory of God. If so, then you will use your life, as Paul says in verse 15, to declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. That's our obligation and our pleasure now is to declare publicly what we know as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, 1 Peter 4, verse 10. To exhort on the one hand and to rebuke on the other. To exhort means to encourage, to inspire those who are seeking to live according to sound doctrine and ethical Christian behavior. And on the other hand, to rebuke those who are in opposition to sound doctrine. Let no one disregard you, he says to Titus, when you act in accordance with these ethical and doctrinal precepts, people will take notice. They will not disregard you. And so may we be so bold in our proclamation of the truth as we wait for Christ to come. Let's pray. Lord God, it's our pleasure and our privilege to be gathered here in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the power of the Holy Spirit to take your word and apply it to our lives in relevant, life-changing ways. 
That's my prayer this morning for, for us as a congregation. That as we leave this place, we will be changed men and women, boys and girls. Our attitude will be changed. Our relationships will be changed. Our desires will be changed. Everything about us will be radically different than the world around us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for redeeming us from this present evil age. May we live as those who have been so redeemed. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.